Hello, welcome to History Scene. We want to thank you, our fans, for all the support, all the feedback we've gotten from you during this past year. The History Scene crew is gonna take a short break. We've got some other projects to work on, but don't fret, we'll be back and plan to be here in September with all new shows. In the meantime, we've gone back to our first two seasons and we've selected both what we think and what you, our audience, think are our best segments. And now I want you to sit back and enjoy the best of History Scene. It may not be the biggest, it's just a little show with stories of Virginia and places you may know. It's about the times and faces that made us who we are. We'll take you to those places. We'll travel near and far. We have history around every tree. We have old time tales to hear and see. Our past will come alive again on your TV screen. While having fun with good old friends Here on History Scene Where are all the places and faces Are traces of history You'll see us then, you'll see us now Here on History Scene Welcome back everyone we're here at Belmont, the home of Gary Melchers, high above the raging Rappahannock at historic Falmouth, Virginia. And the guy to my left here is our executive producer, Tom Van Winkle. But I think you know him as Bear. Well, yeah, thanks for you pulling that out the first episode. And uh, yeah, I'm Bear. Right here at Belmont. Right well, here. You know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah, but now I'm stuck with it. And speaking of good ideas, it was here at Belmont that we first introduced that character that you created, Hugo Back in Time. And now it seems that everybody goes around calling Bill Hatch Hugo. That's true. And, and that episode, I think, was the start of our nicknaming here at, at, at History Scene. You got the nickname of uh, G. Scott Melk. Then we had uh, Bill Huber, who we decided to call Hat Man because it was vast array of headwear. Yeah. And then, of course, we've got our editor, Scott Eyestone, who we started calling CB because he Let's say he does things in a dramatic way, like Cecil B. DeMille. Yeah. Yeah. Little did we know that Hat Man was going to turn out to be such a good roving reporter. That's true, and, and little did we know that how much impact that the Central Virginia Battlefield Trust segment we did would have to that group. Um, it was just shortly after we put that on their website that they enjoyed a pretty good jump in contributions to pay off that wilderness land that they purchased. That's a real good point, Tom, and I wish more people understood it, that local access television can be a good economic stimulus, and I just wish there were ways to make it more accessible. That's true. I mean, it can educate. Um, and I look back at our history scene number one. We got great response from local historians and our audience from our uh, Mystery and Our History piece with Noel Harrison. Yeah, it, it, it can educate, it can entertain. Uh, I think of episode three, that was the first time we did do you know where we are? And people enjoyed that. In fact, let's take a look at that right now. Hi, I'm Tom Van Winkle, and welcome to History Scene's first segment of Do You Know Where You Are? Today I'm standing in front of the Richard Johnson Inn on Caroline Street, and we are about to take a couple of passerbys and ask them if they know the historical significance of where they are. Okay, now all we need to find is somebody is walking along the street and we might be able to find, hey, there's someone. Hi, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. Okay, your name is? Teresa. Teresa, my name's Tom. We're with History Scene today, and we're filming a little segment. And um, I'm going to ask you a little question. Okay? okay, now, it may sound a little funny, but I'm going to ask you, do you know where you are? Uh, I'm on Caroline Street in Fredericksburg. Okay, that's correct. But do you know the historical significance of where we're standing right now? I don't think I do. Okay, let me give you a little hint. It, it has to do with these bricks that are behind us. Now, hey we, Tom, good to see uh, you. Oh, I just Hugo, heard you were you talking doing? about these bricks. How are you, Hugo? Um, you know, my great uncle was an animalologist, and he knows all about this stuff. Th look at this. These are brick weevils, and just look at how they made indentations, and they're well, just well, tearing well, up this wall. Well, wait a minute. 
An animologist? An animalologist. Animalologist. Brick weevil. Brick weevil. You go, there's just no such thing as a brick weevil. Uh, once again, you've got your facts kind of strained. Oh. I apologize for this. He's, he, he's a good guy, but he just keeps coming and doing that. But I'm sorry. Okay, uh, you were about to give me an answer on, on what you think these holes are in the bricks. Uh, I... I would guess bullet holes. Well, if you were to guess bullet holes, you're absolutely right. These holes were made during the Battle of Fredericksburg here in 1862. In fact, I happen to have a mini ball here, and if you care to, you can take and check a fit and see how it fits in some of these holes. Look at that. Perfect fit. There you go. Well, I want to thank you, Theresa, very much for being here on History Scene today. Thank you. I hope you had a lot of fun with us. I did. Now we have to go over to Ferry Farm, where I understand our other roving reporter, Bill Huber, is more likely playing in the dirt. <laughs> Brick weevils. I mean, leave it to Hugo to get the entertaining parts of these shows. No, but that's a good example of entertaining as well as educating. And let's take a look at episode four out of Catherine Furnace with both Hugo and Hatman. History. Hi, I'm Bill Huber, and I'm standing in front of the remains of Catherine Furnace, located here on the Chancellorsville battlefield. Not only was it an industrial site, but it was also the crossroads of a military and industrial history here in Virginia. The original stack for Catherine Furnace was about 36 feet tall, somewhat taller than the one you see over my shoulder right now. Under the stack was the furnace. It was about 30 square feet, and today it's the pile of rock and rubble that you see over my shoulder. In 1846, the furnace was in its prime because it was producing war materials, shot and shell, for the American Army involved in the Mexican War. One of the things they were also producing was something called pig iron. In 1846, Catherine Furnace produced 600 tons of pig iron. Here's a drawing based on archaeological evidence that shows the engine house and the furnace at that time. You can see the furnace under the stack before it became rubble. To the left was the engine house. It contained a whopping 14 horsepower steam engine that ran the air infusing bellows that in turn kept the furnace white hot. Across the road was the all important blacksmith shop responsible for keeping the engine machinery running and the mules and horses in shoes. As we pan to the right in this drawing, we see the casting house where pig iron was made and shot and shells were cast. Further to the right, we see the pattern house, the ball house, and the company's business office. As we move up in the drawing to the hill above the furnace, we can see the coal house where the charcoal was kept dry, the bridge house that provided a platform for loading the furnace from the top and the living quarters. We're now above the furnace, kind of looking down on the top of it. Uh, originally, the top of the furnace was a little bit higher than what it is today, so that it would have been just about level with the top of this hill. Because up on this broad area that's in front of me, a very flat, this is where all the materials were stored, such as your charcoal, the iron ore, and that catalyst material that needed to go into the furnace. Catalyst material could have been limestone, or even used oyster shells at that time to help make the product. At one point, it was necessary to build a covered bridge off to my left that extended out over the furnace. That way the materials could be gathered up, taken to the edge of the stack, dropped right down into the stack. And that stack and the furnace underneath it were probably between 1400 and 2800 degrees because you had to get it hot in order to melt that material. Once it had turned into a liquid, it was then channeled out of the bottom of the furnace into the casting house where they made their pots, pans, shells, pig iron, and all the other products that you could make using this iron. Aside from the chimney hey, and that- Bill, and, uh, so good to see you. I heard you're at my grandpappy's furnace. You know, well, he didn't actually own the furnace. He was the founder, the most important guy here. Oh, okay, Hugo, he was the founder and, and, he, and he, he built this place down here? Is that what no, you're saying? No, Bill, Bill, Bill. The founder was an artisan that was responsible for the proper mix of fuel, ore, 
catalyst and temperature. He monitored the smoke, probably stood right over there a lot of the time. Wow. And he would monitor the temperature of the furnace and he would peek in a little hole and he would look at what the fire looked Amazing. like. Amazing. And, and he was paid by the ton, by the ton. And then he would go to the control room and just watch it all and hit the buttons and make everything happen. Okay, Hugo, the founder and, and built in the smokestack, I believe. But pushing buttons in a control room? Hugo, this is the 1800s. We, we, you know, he did just what you said. But I can't believe they were pushing buttons in a control room then. You know. That was my grandpappy lie. No, he just, you know, it's those facts, Hugo. You gotta work on the facts. As I was saying, besides the furnace and the stack, there's very little evidence of what was going on here. Mother Nature has provided us with a couple of little clues. One of them is when she turned this tree over because it revealed the bottom layers of soil and within that soil, there's charcoal and it's all over the place. Big pieces of charcoal that would have been used in the furnace along with iron ore combined with the catalyst and dumped into the stack. Well, you've got all the makings to make iron here in Spotsylvania County. In many ways, Catherine Furnace marked a crossroad in our military and our industrial history. During the Battle of Chancellorsville, Union infantry came up over these hills and nipped at the very tail end of Stonewall Jackson's flank march. That was the last day Stonewall Jackson would be on this earth. Later in the war, George Armstrong Custer and his cavalry swept through this area, burned and destroyed the entire furnace. The stack you see behind me was rebuilt after Custer's raid, but it was never successful. The whole country was moving into the Industrial Revolution, and metal production was shifting from the woods of Virginia to the steel mills of Pittsburgh. You know, education sometimes is made a, a little easier with maybe a little bit of humor, but it doesn't always have to be over the top Hugo. Let's take a look, and I want you to remember, though, that episode you did on gold mining out in Orange County with our good friend, Frank Walker. Everyone, let's look at that. History. Thanks, Scott. We're out here on a pretty humid and sweltering morning in Orange County today. We're here with Frank Walker, who is a lifelong resident here of Orange County. He is an author, a historian, a tour guide. And Frank penned the book, Remembering a History of Orange County, uh, which he happens to have a chapter on gold mining, which is our subject today. Good morning, Frank. How are you doing? Hi, Tom. Glad to be here. Now, our first question to you today is we've recently seen a reference to the a document which we believe was by Thomas Jefferson about gold mining. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, actually, it was uh, in his Notes on Virginia, something that he wrote for people in Europe to read, to learn how wonderful the new world was. Actually, no mining was involved. It was simply a report that in 1782, a roughly four pound lump of gold bearing ore had been found some four miles downstream of Fredericksburg on the north bank of the Rappahannock and that it yielded a certain amount of gold, actually not much gold. Uh, the fact that it didn't yield much gold, the fact that it was right at the end of the American Revolution, uh, the fact that no ore seam was nearby to this chunk, uh, people just sort of forgot about it. Now Frank, can you tell us a little bit about the mining here in Orange County and a little bit about the life of the miners and if slave labor might have been used? The commercial mining, now it's hard to say when gold was really first discovered here. Uh, but by 1826, commercial mining had begun and it essentially was pit mining to begin with, digging down into the top of these ore seams. And they were digging huge pits, 70, 80 feet wide, down 50, 60 feet, uh, as far as they could go without it caving in. And that was very, very hard work. Uh, done. Initially, certainly, uh, slave labor was used because that was the labor force that was available. Now, once you began to start sinking shafts in the ground and actually do shaft and gallery mining uh, down below the surface, keep in mind that an investment in a slave was serious money. 
the last thing you wanted was for that individual to be injured or, or killed. And it was a whole lot cheaper, uh, particularly by the time that was being done in the 1840s, 1850s. It was cheaper to pick up somebody for, say, 10 cents a day. And uh, if they got hurt, you sent them home. If they got sick, you sent them home. Uh, if you didn't have work for them a particular day, you sent them home. Uh, and certainly, wage labor began to predominate. So actually, they're protecting their investment by not using the slaves if they didn't have to. Uh, absolutely. There's the, there's the great stories of the people who used their slaves on the docks in New Orleans uh, for certain labor. But when certain jobs were to be done that were extremely dangerous, they hired Irishmen. <laughs> Now, Frank, can you tell us a little bit about the peaks and valleys of gold mining here in Virginia? Well, I can do Orange County. Okay, Orange uh, County's great. Virginia generally uh, sort of followed Orange County because the real serious mines were here in this area and in western Spotsylvania. Gold was discovered here for commercial mining purposes, uh, 1826, and initially a lot of gold was found because the seams had uh, been on the surface for years, had weathered, the gold was fairly easy to get. And uh, for example, uh, William Jones of Elwood was renting out uh, mining tracks and one particular miner for over a three year period uh, contributed something between $3,000 and $4,000 a year in royalty payments to Jones, which was a phenomenal amount of money. Uh, in that era, and particularly because Virginia was not having a good time economically at that point. Then it began to taper off because all of the real easy gold was being gobbled up, uh, more investment, uh, more technology was being required, shafts were having to be sunk, uh, and, and the trickle of gold uh, was much smaller. Things, however, picked up as the big mines, the commercial mines, began to run. But then in 1849, gold was discovered in California. Very easily obtainable gold in large quantities. Uh, Five million dollars worth appeared at the U.S. Mints in 1849 alone. And both investors and miners just disappeared from this part of the world. Things really went down into a deep valley miners and investors began to slowly reappear. Uh, the mining picked up again. Then another valley, a deep valley, the American Civil War. Uh, at least in one year, 1864, not a single ounce of gold uh, showed up at the U.S. Mints uh, from Virginia. Following the Civil War, some investors, uh, miners, got the mines going again. Huge water problems here, had to get them pumped out. Uh, but they thought it was worth it. Mines started rolling again with uh, a little gold trickling into the U.S. Mint. And then comes the Great Depression. And a lot of mines immediately shut down. That was the end of them. Some mines tried struggling along, but ultimately uh, the last two major commercial gold mines in Orange County, uh, the Melville, Melville and the Vaucluse, closed down in 1937 and that was the end of commercial gold mining in Orange County. Now there's still gold in the ground if you want to go right out there and dig some you can lose money like they did. We brought a shovel with us so we'll probably do that. After oh yeah you can lose your shirt in a half a day. I probably will. <laughs> Frank I want to thank you very much for being with us here today and uh, filling us in on some uh, very interesting subject matter that's probably not very well known here in the Virginia area and thank you very much. My pleasure. You know Scott that's another thing about doing the History Scene Show we make a lot of friends along the way and to put my executive producer's hat on for a second or third time today, I don't think everybody actually realizes that our show needs to be presented by either the government or a 501c3 organization to be able to be on public access television. Uh, that's right, and of course we need to thank our good friends at the Fredericksburg Area Museum and Cultural Center for presenting us, and we'd be remiss if we didn't take a look at the segment about them. History Sometimes we just don't appreciate what's in our backyard. Uh, my family and I just got back from Boston. I saw tons of museums and historic sites. But how often can you take your family to Boston? 
Many times we pass up local places that are part of our heritage, places that are very interesting and educational, and places that are terrific for a family to visit. For example, there's the Fredericksburg Area Museum and Cultural Center. It's been here for 20 years. But here's the thing, it now contains and has grown to three different sites. The first is the old town hall in the building behind me. It dates from 1816 and was used as a city hall until 1990. Today, it has changing and permanent exhibits. But let me show you the magic of television. I'm on the other side of the camera and I'm standing in the middle of historic Market Square. This was laid out to be the center of the city when it was started in 1728, and it's still, and all through its history, it's the central point of the city of Fredericksburg. Today, the museum sponsors events like concerts here, and every Saturday morning, there are walking tours. But the newest part of the museum is across the street to my right, the Catherine Jones McCann Center. It opened in 2008, and it's in the old 1920s era Planters Bank building. As you enter the McCann building, you come into what used to be the impressive bank lobby. Today, exhibits have replaced the ornate teller windows. Here, for example, are wide-ranging exhibits about the Fredericksburg area during the Civil War. At the back of the main level is the old bank vault, and inside is an exhibit on old money. Everyone, we're here in Market Square, and with me, is Senior Vice President for Collections and Exhibitions. This is Mary Helen Dellinger. Mary Helen, welcome to History Scene. Thank you so much for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I've sort of given that broad overview of what people can do here at the museum, but why don't you tell us a little more? What can people see when they come here? Well, we're really great in that we have two buildings, not just one. Yeah. And uh, we're obviously sitting in back of the Town Hall building, which was our first museum building, and we have three floors here. Huh. Lots of stuff to see. Uh, the first floor is a temporary exhibition space, so that changes all the time. Well, so there's always something new. Always something new to see. All right. On the second floor, we have two permanent exhibitions. Uh, one is called British Heritage, American Style. That's all of the nicest stuff in the museum's collection. <laughs> all of our silver and furniture and paintings and all that fancy stuff that was made here in the 18th and 19th centuries. And then the second gallery is uh, selections of stuff from the Fredericksburg Masonic Lodge, all of their Washington-related pieces. Some really, really great stuff. Now, the museum has programs specifically designed for kids, right? Yes, we do. Um, one of the neatest programs we offer is the second Saturday of every month from 1 to 3, we offer a program in the Learning Center in our other building, the Catherine W. Jones McCann Center changes every Saturday, it's an activity, lots of hands-on things for kids. Great. Sometimes there's an arts and crafts, it's a takeaway that they can take home with them. Um, that is free to uh, museum members and also free with museum admission that day. Now what else in that building would be particularly interesting to kids? Well one of the things when we designed the exhibits over there that we wanted to do was an exhibit on Native Americans, the first Virginians sure. that were here. No one else in the area does that. We're the only one that has that particular exhibition. So when we designed it, we designed it with kids in mind. Um, there's a replica of a Native American dwelling, a Yeehawken, in the gallery. They can go in it. There's little things in there that the Indians would have used in their everyday life. The kids can handle that stuff. Lots of uh, animal tracks that they can touch and put their hands on and try and guess what the animals were. So lots of really neat things over there for kids. Now Mary Helen, I know there's a Civil War exhibit there. I'd like you to tell us about it, but it expands beyond the Civil War. It right? does. It's called uh, Fredericksburg at War, and rather than duplicate what the Park Service has done, because they do a fabulous job with that, we decided to look at the experiences of civilians here, and we look at the Revolutionary War, uh, the Civil War, and World Wars One and Two. And in the exhibit, in addition to some great objects that we have, we also have video that people can uh, watch and listen to some audio where people are reading diaries and letters that civilians left behind about their wartime experiences. Um, we have, a, a, of course, the Johnson Gun Collection is out, yes. the always fabulous Johnson Gun Collection. About 80% of those uh, pieces are finally on permanent display. And we have a great multimedia there as well, where you can set computer touchscreen and you can pull up more information on the guns and look at detailed shots of them. Well, all of that sounds great, and, and I want to thank you for not only the summary, your enthusiasm, but folks, as you see, there is a lot here, so thank you. And thank you for having me. Well, folks, 
That's it for this hey, episode. Hey, Mr. Scott, what a cool place you got here. Wow. You know, I think some of my relatives did some... Hugo, Hugo, I'm sure they did. But now listen, in school, Hugo in school, did you ever study local history? Reading, writing, arithmetic, and history. I had this great teacher, Mrs. Robinson, and she could teach me anything, you know, and she even arranged for me to go off to Harvard to study. Harvard, why didn't you go? Well, I, I'm, I hurt my toe and I might have missed my mama. Wait, 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 your toe, what did that? Never mind, now, now Hugo, more to the point, have you ever been in this great museum? No, I haven't, but you know, I think I could get it right if I went in there and studied. Yeah, you ought to do that, Hugo. See you get later. the facts Got straight. <sighs> Folks, this is a great place, and it's within a 20-minute drive of most of you watching this show. If you want to get an update of exactly what's going on here, you can dial 371-3037 or check the website we've got at the bottom of the page. In fact, folks, if you became a member, and I have done that, you would get automatically updated. But speaking of membership, the Fredericksburg Area Museum is opening in this month of September a special two-year membership drive. They're calling it 2012 by 2012. You see, they want to get over 2,000 members by the year 2012. Folks, it's simple, it's easy, it, it's it, you could just go online again. They're trying to involve individuals, families, businesses in everything that's going on here. So I hope to see you at the museum. History Scene is presented by the Fredericksburg Area Museum and Cultural Center. History Scene is an independently produced community television show by local Fredericksburg, Stafford, and Spotsylvania residents. The programming objectives of History Scene are to educate about our rich historical heritage and stimulate the local tourism aspect of our economy. History Scene is made possible by grants from businesses, organizations, and individuals. To support these objectives and be recognized as you choose, please contact Heritage Media LLC. Your support is critical to allowing History Scene to be brought to you, our viewers. <laughs> what are you laughing at, Bear? That was a serious well, piece. I was just thinking about some of the outtakes from that show. Well, that's true. Now, we've done number one. Now, here's number two. Where are... Uh, yeah, I saw... Folks, that's it for this scene. <laughs> you gotta have heart, all you really need is heart, you can get the da 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 but all you really need is heart. <laughs> you know, I get no respect, in any case, Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Best of History Scene. It may not be the biggest, it's just a little show With stories of Virginia and places you may know It's about the times and faces that made us who we are We'll take you to those places, we'll travel near and far We have history around every tree We have old time tales to hear and see Our past will come alive again on your TV screen While having fun with good old friends Hear our history scene History around every tree We have old time tales to hear and see Our past will come alive again on your TV screen While having fun with good old friends Hear our history scene Where are all the places and faces are traces of history You'll see us then, you'll see us now, here on 
history scene.